Hello and welcome to Global Review. I am Sachin Chaturvedi. We bring to you weekly analysis of key global developments. As always, let's have a look at the headlines. Amid protests, France president imposes economic emergency. Yemen, looking forward for peace, now releases 5,000 prisoners. Talks begin for PM may delay Brexit vote in UK Parliament. After sixth devaluation, Pakistan currency struggles against US dollar. Russia Venezuela signed $5 billion investment contract for oil production. India borrows $400 million from AIIB, total equals to $2 billion. India and UAE reach INR 35 billion rupee agreement. 164 countries announce first global migration deal, lays down 23 objectives for migration. In this uh, segment today, we would be bringing to you detailed analysis of how oil price volatility is affecting us. We cover this under our section across the globe. OPEC has been playing an important role in managing not only the global oil production, but also contributing to oil price volatility. Let's have a look at this report. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC with OPEC Plus, concluded its meeting in Vienna with an agreement for production cuts till April 2019. OPEC and its partners agreed to cut approximately 1.2 million barrels per day from their total output. The members of OPEC will be using October 2018 production levels as their baseline for calculating production cuts. The meeting concluded with exemptions made from Iran, Libya and Venezuela. Russia negotiated a deal for its production cut by 2 lakh barrels per day. OPEC's output reduction will result in an increase in the price of oil. Qatar has decided to leave OPEC after a 60-year-old membership. This decision comes in light of the ongoing Saudi-led air, sea and land blockade imposed against Qatar. Qatar, however, denies political reasons for its exit, claiming its decision is due to Qatar's future energy goals. Qatar is a small oil producer with an output of only 2% amongst the OPEC countries. However, Qatar has emerged as a dominant player in the natural gas sector and is determined to maintain its leadership in LNG production. Globally, oil prices continue to stay volatile and resulted in an increase post the Vienna meeting. Increase in oil price favours Saudi Arabia and Russia given their dominant foreign earnings coming from crude exports. In 2017, Russia, Saudi Arabia and US dominated the global oil production, while Russia and Qatar led the production in natural gas. By mid-2019, an increase in supply is expected as U.S. pipelines are scheduled to enter production. U.S. is estimated to overtake Saudi and Russian oil production as increasing crude prices was seen as a positive sign for U.S. shale oil production. So for current policy analysis, it has emerged as one of the key challenges for almost all the developing countries which are dependent on oil imports. Would Qatar's moving out of OPEC and joining with Russia a mega coalition which is coming in terms of challenging the global oil pricing scenario and how the new technologies are going to contribute the larger and getting more and more complicated geopolitics is an important issue on the table. The second point comes in from the huge violence that we saw last two weeks in Paris. What are the implications? What should be the way forward? And how geopolitics would influence prices of oil? To discuss this in the studio, today we are joined in by Professor Sriram Cholia from Jindal School 
and we are also joined in by a prominent journalist and commentator, Dr. Abad. So, Dr. Abad, let me start with you. How you see uh, Qatar's new position in the larger spectrum of OPEC as far as oil pricing is concerned? And how you see linkage of this with the huge violence that we saw because of oil prices in uh, France? Well, I think it has two elements to the pull out from the OPEC. One is a political element and one is the economical element. In fact, you have stated in your report that they have only 2% to uh, productions in the, out in, in, in the quota in, in the OPEC. But the, nevertheless, it has a very a big impact on the future of the pricing, of course, for the OPEC. But I think it's the, the oil, oil global uh, order is collapsing. Mm. If we see that not only Qatar going to pull, there will be more country to pull. So there could be another reason for it. Which possible candidates you think? Well, the other candidate like Iran could be one of the candidates like Venezuela as well could be one of the candidates because there are 16 members of the... Uh, the so what would be the impact of collapse of... Uh, um, I think we need to see that the United States is trying to call the, uh, the shot now because the United States is t t looking for an alternative source of the energy where they are going for the shale oil and all. And besides also there are lots of grouping of the economical grouping taking place irrespective of their political indifferences but still they are coming together to, to face the challenges for the oil, uh, for the oil uh, security. So there, there is a new uh, phenomena taking place in, uh, around the world. So we can see that people now saying that it has become more of a political body that we should be able to pull out because the Saudis are dominant. Saudi are not uh, honest, uh, honoring their words on the OPEC productions and America using it as a tool to put pressure on Iran, on Venezuela, on Russia and production. You have seen the turmoil yeah. that the United States have created. And if the United States president can call the Saudi Arabia and say cut down the oil prices. It shows that this this is not uh, nothing to do with the with the energy Market. requirement. It's more to do with the political compulsion that they are being forced to do it. So therefore, why to be in a body where you can give the Saudi the upper hand, where Qatar having already differences with them? Yep. But I think we also have to see it from different angle where we are ending the petrodollars era. We are entering into the gas dollars era. Mm. And now they have to price the gas. Well, this is the difference, the f major fighting between the United States and Russia and Iran and uh, Qatar in pricing the, the gas, though it's still priced after, after oil. But at the coming years, we will see more pressure because most of the countries are trying to stay away from the U.S. dollars, where the Americans are putting more pressure on those countries who is denying to deal with the dollars. But the impact of the oil price, uh, Dr. Awad, as we saw in case of France, is quite troublesome in terms of I would say it is contributory because you see we have to look at the the European Union as a yeah. whole there yeah. is a crisis in all the European country there is also studies which shows that there is a gap between the rich and the poor has increased by 1% mm -hmm. and where this 1% came from it came from the poor so mm -hmm. when you are having unemployment where you're increasing the taxes and you don't have a proper economy uh, policy that you follow where people have been blaming Macron for his for, for his economical policy and even one of his ministers said he is just a project to cover up and for the continuity of the government. So do you think with collapse of the oil price order, as we discussed, uh, would it contribute in terms of equitable uh, distribution or equal access to resources? I think I think it will uh, help in, in a small manner. The, what do you need? You need a more austerity measure and you need more to, to deal with the, with the local economical policy you carry on. Europeans have facing this problem because of two reasons. Security reason why the United States is enforcing them to both increase the GDP on spending on military, mm -hmm. on army. So if you are creating this kind of uh, uh, pressure on the economy, which is already collapsing, then I think you are in a big trouble that for the next future. Because social unrest is not only limited to the Arab world where we saw in the Arab Spring. We are seeing now in we Europe see all over much. the world. Dr. And Cholia, let me bring you in unrest. here at this point uh, in terms of how the economic impact of, of uh, this larger challenge would be if uh, uh, the global oil price order, as uh, uh, Dr. Awad said, is going to collapse. And as we see more fractions coming in, how it would be influencing the larger geopolitical settings uh, and also the, the economy of it. I think, Sachin, if you go back three years when the oil prices were at a rock bottom, uh, you know, almost down to $30 a barrel. Yep. Um, Saudi was the one country egged on by the U.S. that believed that they can weather it and they can absorb the losses from the low oil prices. And they thought that that was how they could put pressure on Iran and Venezuela. Uh, and, uh, they, but the problem is that over the years, Saudi is also not able to balance its books. 
Therefore, they have now come for this, uh, you know, production cuts because the um, Mohammed bin Salman imposed austerity measures on his own population. Hmm. So, uh, in order to absorb the losses. So now I think they are not in a position fiscally to continue this anymore. Mm. And secondly, as Dr. Awad is mentioning, there is increasing competition in the oil uh, market between yeah. US and Saudi. Mm. These are so-called, you know, bosom allies. But nonetheless, in fact, the Saudi foreign minister was asked, do you have permission from uh, President Trump to cut production and raise prices? And he says, we are a sovereign country. We don't need permission from anyone. So after Jamal Khashoggi case, I think even though Trump and Jared Kushner, the two big players in the uh, administration, are very much in favor of Crown Prince and sustaining that alliance, there are you know, major questions being raised in the US Congress and more critical attitude to Saudi Arabia. And I think Saudi is now trying to show that it can also play ball with Russia. In fact, uh, Saudi and Russia are coordinating in OPEC. There is yeah. OPEC plus one in order to manage the prices. So there's a bit of a kind of realignment going on. But there you on. see, Shiram, uh, uh, Russia is also partnering with Qatar. So yeah, you find uh, this delicate balancing by Russia uh, now in a, in a new setting uh, where Saudi Arabia is approaching Russia, but Russia is approaching Iran and, and Turkey and Qatar. So a no, new coalition is, is also being encouraged. No, definitely. See, if you go look forward, gas is the future. Even India, Dharmendra Pradhan, our minister said, we are moving towards gasification. And frankly, gas is relatively speaking, environmentally better than oil. So Russia holds the cards because it is the largest producer yes, of gas okay. along yes. with Qatar. So in a way, the balance of power in terms of energy suppliers is also shifting away from Saudi and towards Russia and Qatar. And I think Saudi is trying to somehow preserve the gains by using OPEC as a means to control production and raise prices but you know five to ten years energy transition can happen alternatives and gas seem to be the future so hope for energy transition this is becoming more and more complicated don't go away we would have to stop here for a break welcome back in this section we pick up stories for detailed analysis which you do not find in your newspaper columns we call this beyond the news The long innings of Angela Merkel, they are coming to an end now. The huge leadership that she provided not only to Germany but to European Union itself was very substantive in terms of shaping a new narrative on how it's balancing with whether through Hellingen Dam process which gave way to uh, reach O5 countries bringing in eventual expansion of G20. She also contributed immensely in terms of pushing manufacturing sector in Germany. Let's have a look at this report. Twenty eighteen marks the end of the era of Merkelism as German Chancellor Angela Merkel announced her resignation as the leader of Germany's ruling party, Christian Democratic Union. On December 7, 2018, Christian Democratic Union elected Ennegret Graham Karen Bauer as the leader of the party and successor to Merkel. Angela Merkel will continue to serve her final term as Germany's Chancellor until 2021 when the next federal elections are due to take place. As Chancellor of Germany since 2005 and the first female chairperson of the CDU since 2000, Merkel led the CDU towards the political centre. The open migration policy which allowed 1.1 million refugees passage into Germany during Europe's migration crisis and the reducing vote share of CDU affected Merkel's popularity and influenced her decision to step down. Annegret Graham Karen Bauer held a top position in Merkel's government and is a pro-European leader. The new leader of the CDU has outlined changes to the party's migration policies to break away from Merkel's liberal approach and increase stepped up deportations. As Germany prepares for state elections, the focus of CDU is to regain their voter base in the eastern states, which is inclined towards the alternative for Germany, a far-right party. European politics is facing a rise in far-right politics, primarily in Hungary, Poland and Italy. Moreover, with Brexit, the fears of a disintegrated European Union are on the rise. 
Experts argue that with the exit of Merkel, Germany is likely to focus more on its internal politics. So, Shiram, how you see this great contribution and very important role that Angela Merkel played in the politics of Germany and, of course, in the Europe? Uh, definitely, she had a historic, uh, you know, uh, innings. And uh, if you if she continues and ends her term 2021, that's uh, you know 16 years at the helm. And yeah. uh, yeah. I think in the history of post-war West Germany as well as post-Cold War era, this is one of the longest and uh, she i think the positive side i think merkel the legacy is of course stability and continuity mm. um, and she gave strength to the idea of centrism you know she yeah. also absorbed some of the left the social democratic ideas and brought it as part of the cdu you know pro workers pro welfare you know redistribution even on immigration as we just mentioned she took a position that is more left of center on yeah. this uh, open on the other hand you see the the one that for which she will be faulted i think is the austerity she imposed on the small countries in europe when the eurozone crisis was going on greece spain italy they you know she was very hardline on insisting that they must cut uh, state spending and all that, which actually prolonged the crisis and in a way Europe has not come out of the crisis yet because of this German leadership. So it's a mixed record, but overall I'll say, and one more thing which people forget is, you know, she has normalized uh, the side of women leading uh, Europe's uh, you know, top country, yeah. because now the successor is also female and that's important so because it was seen as natural and, succession. And so how you see Annegret Camp and, and CDU really taking forward the legacy? I think they are going to struggle because uh, Merkel's, the Merkelism is now under challenge with the, by the far right as we just mentioned. And Merkel's open door, she said we can manage in 2015, that was a famous slogan. Now increasingly the German population, even the mainstream has gone anti-immigrant and the Islamophobia and such things have risen. So I think the uh, anagrate will have to move to the, uh, to the right to save. Otherwise, what is going to happen is that like you saw elsewhere in Italy, for example, if the centrist parties are not able to stave off the immigrant uh, mm. concerns and anxieties, then the far right will take advantage and come to power. So I think, and the last point I want to make is European leadership. Angela Merkel was a consensus builder. She worked with many French presidents, with many British, with many Spanish. Even on climate change, she played a she very played leadership role, in Paris. role. I think we're going to miss her, all that role. You Dr. Know? Awad, how you see uh, from the perspective that we talked about about a little while ago, uh, given the unrest in France and the challenges that uh, Dr. Cholia mentioned in terms of emigration, and of course her role in balancing, how you look at uh, well, I her think, absence? Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Chalari, uh, uh, Shiram has very rightly said it on the main point of her legacy that she will be missed because actually she might not have been a strategist in her implementation of her economic policy, but she was more of a palliative and more of the prolongation of the party, ruling party of hers, that she did not go from t into a major decision, especially in the banking system, what it is in the industrial uh, system, where the car auto industry as well, because there are other competitors has come and and, and overall the the global uh, economy is in recessions and also the financial crisis had its impact and Germany has been playing a major role in bailing out most of the banking system in Europe and most of the country which is in debt in, in fact Germany has been playing this major role then the third part which has came and, and impact on the economy is the unemployment which she kept it very low mm. the and, and the her records of the unemployment is very Dr. low Dr. her decision uh, in terms of not going ahead with President Trump when the sanctions were imposed on Iran and German governments and, and German banks actually came forward uh, to support uh, Iran and along with that uh, the other European countries also followed how you see their role in West Asia? Well, I think she's playing a very major role, a very positive, especially when it comes to Iran, because the Germany and in German investment in Iran is also very big. It has been there for years. So therefore, even the American are being targeting, even the European. In fact, if you look at it, this is a new reshaping of the international world order, hmm. where we have to see alliance coming up again. Germany has been falling again apart because of their policy toward Russia, because of their policy toward Iran, toward West Asia. Europeans are not very happy with their positioning now, and the United States is also not happy with that. So therefore, there's a conflict of interest in this part of the world. And Germany will not go by the American, by the American argument on these issues in many ways. They wanted some evidence, hardcore evidence that you wanted to implement. If not, then you, you do not go because of the uh, a compulsion of or, or American dictation of their foreign policy. Therefore, I see her 
more of uh, uh, affirmative in their foreign policy till date autonomy was given. And the second part, which we talk about the demographical changes in Europe. In fact, I did a study of, 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 stra of strategic study of the, uh, the impact of these uh, migration on the economy of Germany and European Union. Oh. And, 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 and that I have come to a conclusion from their own writing that Germany itself was in need of one million hmm. employee in to come That's to right. Syria and, and from Syria and from the rest of the world. And imagine how many they have got from Syria. Yeah. The creamy layer of Syria, 73% are 10 plus 2, 34% are postgraduate. Therefore, you have taken the creamy layer of the society. You are improving the economy, but because of the right wing raise, rising in Europe, it is taking this as a slogan, anti-establishment. The fact of the matter that all, uh, all German parties agrees that the ailing society needed an energetic of one uh, million on that I, issue. I just want to add one thing. See, what happens to the future of the so-called liberal order? Because Merkel was positioned uh, by the left of center and the centrists that she's the answer and the backstop who can prevent this tidal wave uh, being led by Trump of right-wing populism. Yes, but Merkel has been weakened, you know, and the last few years is she'll be like a rump She was figure. losing continuously. So the liberal and, yeah. order itself now is, is, is looking for a new upholder in the yeah. absence of Merkel. We would have to stop here for Book of the Week. So today we have picked up Luke's book on the issue that we were discussing about price volatility in oil. What new actors are going to play? And this book, The New Kings of Crude, it talks about the uh, Anglo-Saxon actors in, in Congo and what kind of role they played and how China and India are going to be different. Shiram, what's your quick comment? I think it's an important work because he's showing that Sudan as a country and then South Sudan after it broke up, both of them actually uh, molded the decision making of Chinese and Indian oil companies, uh, ONGC Videsh uh, from our side and yep. CNPC. Yep. And the argument is that they are different, but in also in ways they replace the Western companies like Chevron, the, uh, the American ones. And they show how the small and weak African countries actually wanted balance. So initially CNPC came, the Chinese overtook the entire Sudanese uh, oil market, and then they realized that it was becoming hegemonic. In, in favor of China. So they welcomed ONGC as a counterbalance. So sometimes we say there is no competition between India and China and Africa. But from the point of view, African countries themselves, we see India a collaboration. Is a necessary counterbalance. In fact, uh, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Congo, all three have played this uh, game. Uh, Dr. Awad, what's your? Well, I think uh, we need to look at it from a very wider perspective in Africa. African century is coming up. And in fact, there is a shortage of natural resources and there's a competition among the nations. So the United States and European kept uh, uh, kept it in the shadow, uh, Europe, uh, Africa for them. And therefore, if we look at it from this book, he is a comprehensive study, no doubt about it, that he has highlighted. But I think what he missed in this, that he's trying to equate the, Amer the Indian and the Chinese along with the American and the, uh, the, 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 the European. Different. That's absolutely different. They have already done the damage. They have already destroyed the society. They are relaying But more. you had an alternative suggestion by Haas. So yes, so Peter Haas have written Peter the Haas Crude book, Oil, yes. which is a very interesting book. In fact, he has shown how they have spoiled the countries. That's even right. The, even the tribes have interfighting among them and the benefit does not go to the public. So therefore, when the Indian moved in and the Chinese, and don't forget that they're creating more wars. And you, you've been in Libya as well. Libya has been the center for India, in China and India. Exactly. And suddenly when they invaded the country, they removed uh, Gaddafi. Now we are in trouble. Similar fashion, Sudan is a, one of the largest Arabic country. In fact, we were ca calling it the, the hub of the Arab world. If they grew only agricultural uh, uh, products, Vegetables, they would yeah. be able to feed Africa and the, uh, the Arab world and therefore they have divided this country because of their oil because of the conflict of interest that they, they wanted this country to be divided so they wanted the, to take the it for themselves also he mentions when South Sudan decided to stop oil supply because they after the independence suddenly the Indian and the Chinese companies uh, realized that they had sunk in a lot of uh, costs and they were not able to recover it so we need to better prepare for these geopolitical models as well you know that's the message of the book yeah, on that point we would have to close uh, uh, please keep on writing your comments, ideas. You're seeing our uh, uh, Twitter handle here. Give us your comments and ideas and suggestions. We would come back next week, same time. Till then, a very good bye.